Jose was born in 1944 to an upper-middle-class family in Havana, Cuba. His father was a well-known soccer player who owned his own accounting firm. His mother was a swimmer who was elected to Cuba's Sports Hall of Fame. Jose had two older sisters, Teresita, known as Terry, and Marta. Although the family was not rich, Jose's parents' accomplishments in sports guaranteed them an honored place in Cuban society. Jose was five years younger than Terry and was spoiled and adored by his mother. In 1960, Jose Menendez was 16 years old. After Castro came to power, Jose's parents saw that their lives in Cuba were forever changed. The first step they made in their decision to leave Cuba was to send their son to the United States. Jose flew to the United States with Terry's fiancé and settled in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, located between Scranton and Allentown. Jose arrived penniless and did not speak or understand English, but was determined to succeed in his adopted country. Jose studied diligently in high school and worked part-time to earn spending money. Due to financial hardship, Jose was not able to achieve one of his dreams, which was to attend an Ivy League college. He promised himself that someday, when he had children, they would achieve his dream and graduate from an Ivy League college. Jose won an athletic scholarship in swimming to Southern Illinois University. Jose did not like Southern Illinois University and is remembered by classmates as withdrawn and sullen. Jose supported himself financially with his athletic scholarship, but eventually walked away from athletics to concentrate on his studies. There was one person who made Jose feel good. Her name was Kitty Anderson. Kitty was born in 1941, the youngest of four children of Charles and May Anderson. Her family lived in Oak Lawn, a suburb south of Chicago. During her early childhood, Kitty's family was solidly middle class. Her father owned a heating and air conditioning business that did well and her mother stayed at home to care for Kitty and her two older brothers, Milt and Brian, and Kitty's older sister, Joan. Although the Anderson family appeared to be loving and close, Kitty's father beat her mother, sometimes in front of their children. Charles Anderson also beat his children. Before Kitty entered grammar school, her father left her mother for another woman. In order to support her family, Kitty's mother worked for United Airlines at Midway Airport outside of Chicago. Kitty's parents eventually divorced and this was the cause of lifelong emotional scars for her. Throughout her childhood, Kitty was withdrawn and depressed. She had difficulty forming friendships and did not have many friends in grade or high school. Kitty's father remarried and continued to live in Oak Lawn. Her mother never remarried and became bitter and depressed by the divorce. Kitty grew up convinced that divorce was the worst thing that could happen in a woman's life. Kitty hated her father and did not have any contact with him for many years after her parents' divorce. In her senior year of high school, Kitty applied to and was accepted by Southern Illinois University. In 1958, her freshman year of college, Kitty began to work in the university's broadcasting department where she learned to produce dramas for radio and television. Kitty gained a great deal of confidence through her participation in these activities. During her senior year in 1962, Kitty had enough confidence to compete in and win the Miss Oak Lawn Beauty Pageant, sponsored by the VFW. Kitty dreamed that after she graduated from college, she would pursue a career in producing and directing commercial radio and television programs in New York City. Kitty and Jose met during Kitty's senior year and Jose's freshman year. After only a short time, Kitty and Jose became inseparable. To Jose, Kitty was attractive not only physically, but in what she represented. Kitty was the daughter of a shopkeeper, the offspring of the American merchant class. By winning Kitty, Jose was establishing his claim to his new country. Jose fulfilled something for Kitty too. Kitty felt that there was a depth to Jose that few people understood or appreciated. She saw someone who was willing to work hard and overcome hardships, not someone who was willing to slide by on family connections or money, like her privileged classmates. Jose told Kitty of his plan to make it big in the business world. When Jose and Kitty were seen together around the Southern Illinois campus, people would stop and stare. After all, it was the early 1960s, they lived in a small, conservative Southern Illinois town and people from different ethnic backgrounds did not mix. 
The civil rights movement in America was centered in the South and had yet to reach Carbondale. Kitty was three years older than Jose was. Their ages and background differences did not seem to matter to Kitty and Jose, they were determined to spend their lives together. Jose and Kitty's relationship caused problems for both of their families. Kitty's family was surprised that she would choose a Cuban teenager as her future husband. Jose's family thought that Kitty was beneath their social standing because her parents were divorced. Jose's parents also thought that at age 19, Jose was too young to marry. Around the time that Kitty graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in communications, Jose and Kitty eloped and were secretly married in 1963. After their marriage, Jose and Kitty moved to New York City. Jose's parents had fled Cuba, his mother in 1961 and his father a short time later. They had settled in New York City. Jose gave up his athletic scholarship at Southern Illinois and transferred to Queens College, City University of New York, while Kitty found a job teaching grade school. During the early years of her marriage, Kitty's dreams of working in broadcasting began to fade and she discarded her plans to obtain a master's degree in order to support Jose and his career. In 1967, Jose graduated from Queens College with a CPA degree. He went to work for Coopers and Librand, an international accounting firm. Kitty continued to teach grade school. In 1969, Jose was sent to Chicago to audit Lion Container, a client of Coopers and Librand. Jose so impressed the management of Lion Container that they asked him to come to work for them as the company's controller. Jose was 25 years old. Jose, Kitty, and their infant son, Joseph Lyle, born on January 10, 1968, moved to Hinsdale, Illinois. Kitty became a full-time mother, while Jose worked hard and turned Lion Container into a profitable company. In 1970, Jose was named president of Lion Container. The position did not last long because Jose and the chairman of the board became involved in a fight over the direction of the company. In 1971, Jose went to work at Hertz, as an executive in the car leasing division and the Menendez family moved from Illinois to the East Coast and settled in New Jersey. Jose's second son, Eric, was born on November 27, 1971. In 1973, Jose became Hertz's chief financial officer. Jose rose through Hertz's ranks and in 1979, when he was 35, became Hertz's worldwide general manager. At Hertz, Jose earned a reputation for abusing subordinates. This reputation would follow him for the remainder of his life. In 1980, Jose's career ended at Hertz. Another man was brought in and made president and Jose was reassigned to the entertainment division of RCA, Radio Corporation of America, the company that owned Hertz. In 1981, Jose was assigned to RCA's record division, which was saddled with overpaid, aging recording stars. Jose tried to turn the division around by signing the Eurythmics and Jefferson Starship. At RCA, Jose's ethics came under scrutiny. An example of Jose's questionable ethics was his practice of shipping large quantities of albums to record stores in order to make sales appear larger than they were. In 1986 alone, RCA was forced to honor $25 million in returned albums. By 1985, at the age of 41, Jose had risen to become the executive vice president and chief operating officer for RCA Records Worldwide Operations. However, as hard as he tried, Jose was unable to turn RCA Records around. From the beginning of their marriage, Kitty had always given Jose the freedom he desired. As much as he promised her that their marriage would be a partnership, in reality, Jose made decisions for both of them, often without consulting Kitty. During his life, Jose acquired a number of mistresses. Jose's longest lasting affair began in 1978 with a woman named Louise, who was a dark haired, self confident businesswoman. Louise and Jose traveled together and entertained as a couple in Louise's townhouse in Manhattan. Jose cared deeply about Louise yet never gave any thought to leaving Kitty. He also never considered ending his affair with Louise. Jose felt good with Louise. She buoyed his ego. For some time, Kitty was not aware of Jose's indiscretions. Jose was able to soothe Kitty with false, yet convincing claims of his faithfulness, but Kitty became suspicious of his behavior. In 1981, 
Kitty uncovered one of Jose's relationships and walked out of their home for several days. Jose managed to convince her to come home, more so for the brothers than because he loved her, according to Jose's brother-in-law. In 1986, at about the same time that Jose's career at RCA was coming to an end, Kitty found out about Louise. Jose told Kitty about Louise and his other affairs. This sent Kitty into a depressive spiral and she talked about committing suicide. Through contacts that Jose had made while at RCA, he was able to find a position as the president of Live Entertainment in California. Live was a video distribution and duplication company and was partially owned by Carol Co., a movie production company, best known for producing the Rambo pictures. Jose jumped at the chance to become involved in the film business and had no problem uprooting his family and moving them from the East Coast to the West Coast. At the time that Jose was brought in to run Live, it had posted a loss of $20 million for 1985. Jose saw another opportunity to turn a struggling company around, Kitty wasn't so positive about the move. She had spent the past 16 years building a life outside of her marriage. Kitty had an established a network of friends who she cared about and who in turn cared about her. Jose and Kitty had recently purchased a home in Princeton, New Jersey, that Kitty considered her dream house. Nevertheless, Jose decided that it would be in Kitty and Eric's best interests to move to California with him. They settled in Calabasas, an upper-middle-class suburb in the northwestern part of the San Fernando Valley, Lau remained beyond in Princeton to attend college. Jose dedicated himself to raising great sons who would carry out his plans for the future and continue his legacy. Because Jose had fought his way up the corporate ladder, he understood that there was an easier and more refined way to reach the top and he set about training his sons to reach that peak. When the brothers were young, Jose had rules for everything, what they could eat, who they could spend time with, and what they read and thought about. Every hour of every day was to be accounted for. Jose and Kitty did not take into account that they were dealing with young children, nor did they consider that their children could be flawed or that they themselves might be flawed. Jose's greatest flaw was his viciousness that probably grew out of his insecurity about his ethnicity. Jose relished humiliating Anglo colleagues who made mistakes, yet at the same time, he sought acceptance from them through his efforts to transform himself into an American. He encouraged business colleagues to call him Joe, rather than Jose. The pressures of meeting Jose's demands appeared early on Lyle and Eric. Both brothers developed stutters, stomach pains, and had a habit of grinding their teeth. Both brothers also developed nasty tempers. As they grew older, the brothers were drawn to each other for companionship and solidarity in order to face their father's control. Eric grew up worshipping Lyle. Eric often told his friends how much he admired his brother. Eric's friends couldn't understand why. They thought Lyle was serious trouble. Eric's worship of Lyle probably came from the fact that Jose was so remote that his younger son did not feel he could approach him. Lyle was approachable, while Jose was an overwhelming presence. The brothers' friends would comment that Lyle and Eric were extremely close, but that their personalities were very different. Lyle was described as aloof and witty, while Eric was described as sensitive and quiet. Lel was also described as having the stronger personality. Beginning when the brothers were in grade school, Jose posed questions about current events at the dinner table. Occasionally Eric was allowed to answer, but most of the questions fell on Lyle, to answer. As the brothers grew older, the questions became more complex. Jose decided that each brother should select one sport to excel in. Jose encouraged the brothers to pick a sport that did not require them to be members of a team. He felt that teamwork challenged his authority and called into question the way he was raising his sons. By the time Lyle was 12 and Eric was 9, they had selected tennis. In 1979, the family was living in Pennington, outside of Princeton, New Jersey. Lyle and Eric attended the Princeton Day School, a private school. At the Princeton Day School, both brothers were considered average students. Lyle developed problems academically when he was in the sixth grade. His teacher found that he was not well prepared and did not have the ability to concentrate. Teachers at the Princeton Day School felt that both Lyle and Eric had learning problems, but Jose would not accept that his sons had flaws. 
The teachers noticed that the homework the brothers turned in was far better than the work completed in class. Teachers also noticed that the brothers were immature compared to their classmates. At the age of 14, Lyle still wet his bed and played with stuffed animals. There were other signs that Lyle and Eric were headed for serious trouble. In 1982, when Eric and Lyle were about 12 and 15, their cousin Diane van der Molen stayed with the Menendez family for the summer. One night, the three cousins began to playfully wrestle. Suddenly and without warning, Lyle and Eric began to undress Diane. Without saying a word, the brothers tied her up and stripped off her shirt. Diane screamed and the brothers retreated from their attack. The brothers had attacked her like a pack of dogs, with no warning. As suddenly as the attack had begun, it ended. Around the same time, Diane experienced another attack. This time, she and Lyle were watching television. Without warning, Lyle struck. He climbed on top of her and began to fondle her breasts. Like the attack that came earlier, she had not enticed Lyle and the attack ceased as soon as she was able free herself. Joseph Lyle Menendez was born in New York City on January 10, 1968, and grew up outside of Princeton, New Jersey. Lyle's first romance came when he was 15. His relationship with his girlfriend, Stacy Feldman, was as innocent and chaste, as the previous attacks on his cousin Diane had been perverse and sexual. Stacy managed the men's varsity tennis team at the Princeton Day School and Lyle was the number one ranked player on the team. Their first date was to see Raiders of the Lost Arkansas Lyle was a huge movie fan and going to the movies was, perhaps, the only experience that Lyle was able to enjoy for himself without having it filtered through his parents. Lyle seemed to have grown up, completely believing to be true what he saw on the movie screen. He never seemed to be able to distinguish between fact and fiction. Stacy and Lyle fell in love. They walked around Princeton Day hand in hand, which was against the rules. Teachers and administrators let this infraction pass because they felt that Stacy and Lyle were awkward kids who needed each other. At the end of the school year, Lyle and Stacy were voted most married by their classmates. Lyle and Stacy talked about getting married and having children. Lyle lavished jewelry and other gifts on Stacy. Stacy ended the relationship when she went off to college, realizing that she wanted to experience more of life and that she was too young to get married. Lyle was hurt by Stacy's rejection and tried to win her back by promising to buy her a fur coat. Stacy was not interested and Lyle moved on. Jose dreamed that Lyle would attend an Ivy League college. Lyle, who was not a good student, told his friends that he wanted to skip college and open a restaurant with his father's financial backing. Jose would not entertain thoughts of anything less than an Ivy League education for Lyle. When Lyle initially applied to Princeton in 1986, he was rejected. He enrolled in a local community college and submitted another application to Princeton for the 1987 school year. While Lyle waited to hear from Princeton, he met and began to date Jamie Pysarsik, a waitress at a local Princeton restaurant. Jamie was also a tennis player and five years older than Lyle was. Kitty and Jose did not like Jamie because they felt that Jamie was dating Lyle because he was the son of wealthy parents. Lyle was accepted to Princeton in 1987, more on the strength of his ethnicity and ability to play tennis than on his standardized test scores and high school grades that were just average. During the summer of 1987, Lyle and Jamie announced that they were engaged. This announcement angered Jose. At 19, Jose felt that Lyle was too young to be married. Shortly before Lyle was to begin at Princeton, Jamie moved to Alabama to teach tennis. Lyle followed her. Jose was upset by this and secretly arranged to sponsor Jamie on a European tennis tour. Jose thought that once Jamie was out of the picture, Lal could concentrate on Princeton without any distractions. Jose was wrong. Lal followed Jamie to Europe. Final admission to Princeton is contingent on each admitted freshman signing a letter promising to obey the honor code. The honor code has been in place at Princeton since 1893. Lal signed it probably thinking that any trouble he got himself into could be handled using the ways Jose had taught him, lie, cheat, steal, but don't get caught. During his first semester at Princeton, Lyle was accused of plagiarism. 
Specifically, Lau was required to complete a laboratory assignment in his Psychology 101 class, a freshman-level course. Lau was accused of copying a lab partner's homework assignment and turning the assignment in as his own work. When Lyle realized how much trouble he was in, he asked Brendan Scott, a priest and doctoral student, to assist him with his defense. Lyle told Brendan that he had missed a number of previous assignments in class and, because of this, could not afford to miss another. During this time, Lyle was traveling back and forth on weekends to California to visit his family. During the weekend before the psychology lab was due, Lal had traveled to California and lost his notebook with his notes in the airport. Lal asked his lab partner if he could look at his assignment. The assignment that Lal handed in resembled Lyle's lab partner so closely that the instructor singled it out and brought it to the attention of campus authorities. Jose found out about the plagiarism accusation from his sister, Terry, in whom Lyle had confided. At first, Jose did not think there would be any serious consequences for Lyle. Jose sent Lyle a statement to read about ethics before the disciplinary committee. Lyle, as usual, when he was in trouble, tried to cover himself in Jose's protective cloak. Both Jose and Lyle underestimated the trouble that Lyle was in. After a four-hour hearing, the disciplinary committee deliberated for one hour and found Lyle guilty of plagiarism and suspended him for one year. After learning of the outcome, Jose flew immediately to Princeton for a meeting with Princeton's president. At the meeting, Jose argued that the punishment was unduly harsh and did not fit the crime. Jose argued that this was just one homework assignment and not a large part of Lyle's grade for the class. The president was unmoved and informed Lyle that could return to Princeton in 1988 in good standing. Lyle had come face to face with the heart of Princeton and failed Princeton's test. Lyle hated school and rarely participated in campus activities. He was so devoted to winning and being first that he had a difficult time just being one of many struggling students competing at an Ivy League college. Although Lyle was humiliated and wanted to transfer to UCLA or the University of Pennsylvania, Jose would not hear of it. During the year that Lyle was out of school, Jose made sure that he was kept busy. Jose was concerned that he was giving his sons too many advantages and creating rich spoiled brats. Jose put Lyle to work at life. Lyle was responsible for reviewing expense reports and looking for ways to improve efficiency and reduce costs. Lyle was treated like any other employee and had to make an appointment to see Jose. Even though Lyle's employment at Live was brief, it left a deep and lasting impression on him. Lyle saw how the atmosphere in the office grew tense when Jose was around and how Jose berated employees in front of other employees. Lyle told his friends that he was resented at Liv because he was the boss's son. The fact was that Lyle was resented at Liv, not because he was the boss's son, but because of his lack of effort. Lyle was remembered by those at Live as showing up late and unapologetic for work, ignoring orders not paying attention and skipping work entirely on warm days to play tennis. Nasty, arrogant, and self-centered, was the way some co-workers described Lyle. Finally one of Jose's associates went to him and complained about Lyle. Jose asked the associate what he would do if Lyle was not the boss's son and the associate said fire him, so Lyle was fired. When Lyle returned to Princeton in the fall of 1988, he continued his relationship with Jamie Pysarsik. Lyle's return to Princeton began badly when he discovered that he was assigned a roommate. Lyle wanted a single. According to the hall's student advisor, when Lyle saw the belongings of the other student in the room, he threw them in the hall. The student advisor said that Lyle had an I'll do what I want, when I want to attitude. Jose came to Lyle's defense. He wrote a letter to Princeton requesting a single for Lyle. Lyle was given a single and like the previous year, did not participate in any campus activities. The only outside activity that Lyle seemed to show any interest in was cultivating friendships with a group of students who were also jocks. In February 1989, Jamie introduced Lyle to Donovan Gaudreau. Donovan came to Princeton after spending two years at a junior college in Northern California. He had always wanted to travel and made his way across the country, winding up in Princeton because he was attracted to the school's reputation and the large number of people his own age. Donovan was trying to sort out his future plans. 
Lyle and Donovan found they had a lot in common and Donovan soon became Lyle's best friend. Kitty and Jose were glad to have Donovan around because now that we're living in California, they could no longer complete Lyle's homework for him. Donovan was willing to write Lyle's papers for him in an effort to keep Lyle from failing. During the spring of 1989, Lyle began to date a model named Christy. Christy was 30 years old, nine years older than Lyle was. This relationship upset both Jose and Kitty. There was another issue that upset Jose even more and that was Lyle's continued desire to transfer to UCLA. Lyle was tired of Princeton, but Jose would not entertain any thoughts of Lyle transferring to another school. After Lyle returned from spring break, Donovan was accused of stealing from students in Lyle's dorm. Rather than defend Donovan, who insisted he was innocent of the thefts, Lyle confronted him with two of his friends. Donovan was forced to leave Princeton. In his haste to leave Lyle's dorm room, Donovan forgot to pack his wallet that contained his driver's license, social security card, and other identification. Eric Galen Menendez was born on November 27, 1970, in Blackwood, New Jersey. Eric grew up emulating his older brother and for a time lived in the shadow of Lyle, especially at the Princeton Day School. It seemed that neither brother fit in at school. They were both considered mysterious loners, who laughed only at their own private jokes. They did not join in or play with other children. Eric's schoolwork, like Lyle's, was average. Throughout grade and high school, Kitty completed much of Eric's homework for him. Eric learned early in life that Jose was grooming Lyle to become the future leader of the family. He grew up sad and withdrawn. When Jose, Kitty, and Eric moved to California in 1986, Eric was a sophomore in high school. Eric enrolled at Calabasas High School. Away from his brother and the comparisons that were often made between them at the Princeton Day School, Eric found his own identity. Eric made friends with a group of boys who were like him, cocky, loud, and with a rebellious streak. Kitty had been worried about Eric's sexual orientation for some time. Kitty believed that Eric was homosexual. When they moved to Calabasas, Kitty gave Eric an order to find a girlfriend in six months. Eric found an older girl at Calabasas High, but their relationship was short-lived. At a party, Eric and the girl argued and Eric locked the girl in a room. He would not let her leave. She screamed and yelled, but Eric would not let her out. Finally, Eric let the girl go. The girl had enough of Eric. Later she recalled that he was one of the oddest guys I've ever met. He's very arrogant, very confident, but deep down, he's got a lot of problems and insecurities. Eric later had another girlfriend, Janice, whom Kitty and Jose both liked. Unlike Lyle's girlfriends, whom Kitty found cheap, Kitty thought highly of Janice. Perhaps Eric's most important relationship at Calabasas High was with Craig Signorelli. Craig was the captain of the tennis team and Eric was the number one ranked player on the team. Craig and Eric spent a great deal of time together and wrote a third-rate screenplay entitled Friends. The script was a 62-page thriller about a son from a wealthy family who reads his parents' will and learns that upon their deaths, he will inherit $157 million. The son murders everyone to get his hands on his parents' money before being killed. In July 1988, Eric and Lyle began breaking into homes in Calabasas. The brothers burglarized the homes owned by parents of their friends and were surprised by the large amounts of cash and jewelry that they were able to steal. The brothers had found an easy source of spending money, rather than having to ask Jose for a handout, or listen, Jose, lecture about hard work. The amount of money and jewelry that Lyle and Eric stole was estimated to be more than $100,000, large enough to be classified as a felony offense called grand theft burglary. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's detective who investigated the burglaries received a break in the case after Eric was stopped for a driving violation in Calabasas and stolen property was found in his car trunk. Later the detective discovered that a safe in one of the homes that the brothers had burglarized was found in another home burglarized by the brothers. It appeared that the thieves had developed a guilty conscience and returned a safe they had stolen to the wrong home. Jose was furious about the burglaries. Jose did not want his sons to spend any time in jail and hired Gerald Chaleff, a well-respected criminal defense attorney, to represent them. 
Chalef was able to work out an agreement with the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office that would absolve Lyle of any participation in the burglaries, if Eric took responsibility for all the crimes. Eric was a juvenile and had no previous record. Chalef was able to convince a judge to sentence Eric to community service with the homeless and for the brothers to undergo psychological counseling. Jose wrote a check for $11,000 to the victims to cover items that had been stolen by the brothers, but that had disappeared and could not be returned. The burglaries were the talk of Calabasas. It seemed that neighbors of the Menendez family were uncomfortable knowing that Lyle and Eric were free and not the least bit remorseful. Jose blamed Eric's friends, instead of Eric for the burglaries, just as he had blamed Princeton for Lyle's plagiarism rather than Lyle. Jose probably had a difficult time understanding the brothers' behavior and why Lyle and Eric had victimized friends, people they supposedly valued. Jose began to complain about living in Calabasas. He told people at Lib that the family was receiving harassing telephone calls and that his tires had been slashed. It may have all been talk and a way of Jose saving face. He told associates that he felt that he and his family would be safer living in Beverly Hills. These were not the only burglaries that the police were able to pin on the Menendez brothers. In April 1988, two burglaries took place at the New Jersey office of the Sierra Club and the office of the Princeton Friends of Open Spaces. In these burglaries, office equipment was stolen with a value of approximately $1,100. The offices were housed in the same property that the Menendez family owned just before they moved to California and the house in which Lyle had lived in before entering Princeton. Jose and Kitty had sold the house in November 1987. The police were left with few clues as to who committed the burglaries. In both burglaries, the burglar had entered the home through a second-floor bathroom. The police were finally able to connect Lyle to the burglaries after a confidential police informant came forward. The informant told the police that one day during the summer of 1988, he had been riding to the beach with the Menendez brothers when Lyle played a cassette tape. The tape was a recording of voices talking. There was also background noise. Lyle bragged to the police informant that they were listening to a tape recording of a burglary that Lyle committed at his old house in Princeton. Lyle was never charged with these burglaries. By the time the police were able to connect Lyle to these crimes, he was already in jail on more serious charges. Jose was doing well at life. His contract had recently been renegotiated and extended until December 31, 1991. In recognition of Jose's importance to live, the company invested in a key man life insurance policy that would guarantee that if Jose died, the company could continue operating without worrying about going under. The policy was valued at $15 million. Live also purchased a key man personal policy for Jose's family that was valued at $5 million. Jose was to name a beneficiary as soon as he took a routine physical examination. It was expected that Jose would name Kitty as the beneficiary, which was customary under California community property laws. As spring turned into summer, Lyle was facing several major problems. Lyle's girlfriend, Christy, told him that she was pregnant. Jose found out and went to see her. According to Lyle, Jose intimidated her into having an abortion. Kitty later told one of her friends that Jose paid Christy $100,000. After paying Christy off, Jose and Kitty demanded that Lyle give her up for good. Lyle's spring semester report card from Princeton was terrible. His grades were dismal and included 1F. Lyle was on academic probation, despite Donovan's assistance with his papers and assignments. According to Carlos Baralt, Jose's brother-in-law, Jose tried to adjust his expectations to meet Lyle's academic performance and tried not to put too much pressure on Lyle, all he wanted Lyle to do was pass his classes. Academic probation was not the only problem Lyle was having at Princeton. Shortly after he came home, Jose and Kitty were notified by mail that Princeton was placing Lyle on disciplinary probation after some pool tables in his residence hall were damaged during a party he had thrown. Lyle tried to place the blame for his being placed on disciplinary probation on his friends. This wasn't the end of Lyle's problems. His New Jersey driver's license was suspended. Lyle had also caused the family's privileges at their country club in Princeton to be suspended. He and Donovan took a nighttime golf cart right across the club's greens that caused a large amount of damage.
Jose made full restitution to the country club. Jose and Kitty could not understand what was wrong with their sons. There were so many problems with Lyle and Eric. Jose was losing his patience and was less and less willing to be persuaded by Lyle's rationalizations. Jose and Kitty were so desperate to drive home to their sons how serious their circumstances were that they used the only thing that they thought would get through to them, they threatened to rewrite their wills and leave the brothers out completely. Jose's first will had been written in 1980, before he had amassed his wealth. The will stated that if Jose and Kitty died in a common disaster, Lyle and Eric would receive the entire estate. After graduating from Beverly Hills High School, Eric competed in a number of tennis tournaments during the summer. He initially played well and he won his first round matches, however, he lost in the second round each time. In August, Eric returned to Beverly Hills and waited to begin college at UCLA. Eric had also been accepted at UC Berkeley, but chose to attend UCLA because it had a better tennis team. In order to encourage Lyle to exert more effort in school, Jose purchased a condominium outside of Princeton for him. The condo had two bedroom suites and would be perfect when Kitty and Jose came to visit. They could stay in one of the bedrooms without intruding on Lyle. Lyle asked Kitty to decorate the condo for him. As the summer came to an end, tensions in the house seemed to escalate. Kitty began to lock the door to her bedroom at night and she kept two twenty-two rifles in her closet. She would not allow Lyle and Eric to have keys to the house. When the brothers came home at night, Kitty would let them into the house, even if she had to be awakened from sleep. It was apparent that something was frightening Kitty. Her fears were probably exacerbated by something the brother's psychotherapist, Jerome Oriel, told Kitty. Kitty's psychiatrist had recommended Jerome Oziel when Eric and Lyle were ordered to undergo psychological counseling for the Calabasas burglaries. Shortly after Eric started treatment with Oziel, he gave permission to Oziel to discuss the contents of his sessions with Jose and Kitty. Kitty's fears may have been brought on by something she learned from Oziel. On July 19, 1989, Kitty went to her therapist and told him that she feared her sons were sociopaths, a psychiatric term used to describe a person who lacks a conscience. Kitty's therapist made notes of the session that indicated that Kitty was concerned that her sons were narcissistic, lacked consciences, and exhibited signs that they were sociopaths. On August 19, 1989, the Menendez family chartered a boat from Marina del Rey and went shark fishing. According to the crew of the boat, they did not seem to be much of a family. Jose stayed in the back of the boat and fished, while Kitty went below and stayed in the boat's cabin because she was seasick. The brothers stayed to themselves at the bow of the boat. The evening of Sunday, August 20, 1989, was warm in Beverly Hills. The maid had the night off and the white, for a million dollars, 23-room Mediterranean-style mansion at 722 Elm Drive was quiet. The owners of the home, Jose and Kitty Menendez, were in the family room dozing while a James Bond thriller, The Spy Who Loved Me, played on the VCR. The couple's sons, Lyle, 21, and Eric, 18, had gone out for the evening. Although she was 47 and a little overweight, Kitty was still attractive. She had blonde hair and green eyes. At 44, Jose could pass for someone much younger. He still had a full head of thick black hair and was in good physical shape from playing tennis. Around 10 p.m., a teenage girl was outside her home, located down the street from the Menendez mansion, waiting for her boyfriend. The girl noticed a small car drive up and stop in front of the Menendez home. There were two men inside the car. The men exited from the car. One man went to the trunk and the other walked toward the house. The girl lost interest and looked away. The Menendez mansion was set back from the street, shaded by dense foliage and protected by an elaborate security system. The house had previously been rented to a succession of business and entertainment people, including the artist formerly known as Prince and Elton John. A high iron fence surrounded the mansion and there were iron gates barring the entrance to the semicircular driveway in front of the home. On this evening, the gates located in front of the driveway were open and the security system was off. The men entered the home through the French doors in the study. They walked down the hallway toward the family room, located in the back of the house. 
The men entered the family room, which was illuminated only by the light coming from the television screen. Jose was dozing on the tan leather couch, sitting at the end nearest the door leading to the hallway. Jose's legs were stretched out in front of him, his feet were on the coffee table along with two dishes that contained the remains of a berry and ice cream snack. Kitty was lying under a blanket, her body stretched out across the couch, her head in Jose's lap. One of the men pointed his 12-gauge Mossberg shotgun at the couple and squeezed the trigger. Two shots were fired at Jose, one shattered the glass and splintered the wood of the French doors behind the couch where Jose was sitting. One pellet struck Jose in the left elbow, another struck him in the right arm, followed by another. The shots immobilized Jose. One of the killers walked behind Jose and placed the shotgun against the back of his head and fired. The shot blew off the back of Jose's head. Jose's lifeless body came to rest on the couch, slumped slightly to the right. His hands rested on his stomach and his feet on the floor. After the first shots were fired at Jose, Kitty became alert. She woke up to find herself spattered by Jose's blood and body tissue. Kitty stood and began to turn away from her attackers, taking a step or two before being shot in the right leg near her calf and in her right arm. Kitty fell between the couch and the coffee table. She struggled to stand again and tried to regain her balance, but she slipped as she stepped into her own blood. She stood long enough for her blood to flow vertically down her leg. She tried desperately to walk away, but another shot was fired, which brought her down. Now that she was on the floor, her killers fired indiscriminately, riddling her body with shotgun pellets. Kitty was hit in the left thigh from a range that was so close that the paper wadding that contained the pellets caused her leg to break. She was shot in the right arm, then the left breast, which perforated her left lung. A quart of her blood flowed into her chest cavity. Kitty was not dead. She continued to breathe and tried to crawl away from where she was felled, but could not. The killers were out of ammunition. They paused, unsure of what to do next. They probably wondered if Kitty would be able to identify them and tell the police who they were and what had happened. They decided they could not take a chance on this happening and ran to the car to get more ammunition. They reloaded their shotguns with birdshot, instead of the ball-bearing-sized pellets that they had used before. One of the killers ran back inside the house and into the family room where Kitty lay dying. The killer leaned over the coffee table and placed the shotgun against Kitty's left cheek and fired. Kitty's body was shot ten times. He head had been struck four times. Her skull was shattered. One of the killers ran back inside the house and into the family room where Kitty lay dying. The killer leaned over the coffee table and placed the shotgun against Kitty's left cheek and fired. Kitty's body was shot ten times. Her head had been struck four times. Her skull was shattered. The killer was not finished. He shot both Jose and Kitty near the left knee. The final act the killers performed was to carefully gather the shell casings from the spreading pools of blood that now covered the couch, floor, and rug under the coffee table. This was the scenario that the police and medical examiner pieced together about the murders of Jose and Kitty Menendez. Years later, the killers would provide an entirely different account of the murders. Jose was 45 years old when he died and Kitty was 47 years, and then at 11.47, a call came into dispatch from Lyle. So it actually took officers a while to get to the scene, it's weird. The boys expected police to be there extremely quick as soon as the gunshots went off, they lived close to neighbors, and they figured someone had to call the police. Plus they were officers, you know, patrolling in their fancy rich neighborhood. This kind of stuff doesn't happen there. They thought that the gunshots would attract a bunch of police, but they were shocked when they went out of the house. And we're just waiting there. No one showed up and the cops of course they did show up, but it just wasn't as quick as he would expect officers who are there, said the two of them came out of their house, hysterically screaming, they seemed really traumatized, Eric collapsed onto the lawn, and curled up in a ball, he was shaking hyperventilating and just screaming uncontrollably. According to officers, Lal was trying to comfort him but was also hysterical. The officers who were there said their grief seemed genuine, they seemed heartbroken and petrified. So then they go inside and it is a horror scene. 
The den is covered in blood, the ice cream bowls are spilt and then their two bodies are there disfigured because they have been shot so many times they were unrecognizable. So of course, they started their investigation with the boys, talking to them and asking where they boys were tonight. And they had been at the movie theaters, they said they originally had tried to see a license to kill, but that was sold out, so they ended up going to watch Batman instead. Then after this, they said they went to the Taste of Law Festival and came home to this scene and police found them to be very credible. They believed their whole story so much so that they decided to not even test their hands for gunshot residue, which is very weird because that's normally just standard procedure for anyone who's in a crime scene or near crime scene where there's guns involved, but they were so moved by the emotions that the boys were having that they just figured there was no way they had any involvement this was some random hit, and it was probably mob-related because of their kneecaps, and the boys really pushed to the story they thought it made a lot of sense too they said that their father had some connections possibly to organized crimes, and there's people out there that would want to see him dead, but as detectives started to look into the case a little more and analyze the crime scene they felt like the mob theory just didn't actually check out the main reason being that this crime was messy, and it looked personal, because normally with a mob hit they come and they shoot the person in the head, they do it as quick as possible, and leave behind this little blood as possible. But this was a bloodbath, plus they figured that Kitty probably would have been kept alive, because she wouldn't have been the target. Plus, they figured that there were plenty of other people that could have done this that hated Jose in his career he had belittled, humiliated, fired tons of people. There are plenty of people who would be seeking revenge on him. They interviewed several co-workers and ex-employees, but nothing hand out. No one seemed like they liked that angry at Jose. And when people found out in the community that Jose and Kitty had been killed, they were pretty shocked, especially about Kitty's murder, because she was known as a really friendly, well-liked person. To everyone she seemed like a loving mother, a devoted wife, so why would anyone want to kill her in such a brutal way? But no one thought that it could have been Eric and Lyle that did this, and they were sticking to their story. They acted incredibly devastated by the loss of the parents, and also very scared. They started living out of hotels, right away claiming that they were afraid that whoever did this to their parent would come back and kill them. They ended up getting bodyguards and started wearing bulletproof vests, but they also started taking advantage of the money right away, and they started spending their parents' wealth immediately. August 24 exactly the day before their parents' funeral Lyle ended up buying three Rolex watches they showed up to the funeral all decked out with brand new shoes, and they showed up and the boys were acting very weird few people noticed this especially Lyle he started making a casual jokes about his father and people thought that was strange. And it was a big funeral, there were about 200 people there. But very few of these people were actually their friends, Jose, and Kitty didn't really have that many friends and attend a lot of social dents or parties. So a lot of these people were just people that worked with Jose, probably people that didn't even like him. Then they also had a second funeral service, a few days later. And this time, Lal gave one of the eulogies, and he talked about how much he loved his father and how he was so proud of him and would miss him so much. But they didn't seem that sad after the funeral like the spending spree, just continued right away. Lel ended up buying a Chuck Spring Street Cafe restaurant, in Princeton, for $550,000. He also bought himself that Porsche he always wanted, which was $60,000. He ended up renaming his restaurant, Mr. Buffalo's. And he was all about the new business, he even decided to start a new company called Menendez Investment Enterprises. He hired some friends from Princeton that he knew, and he also planned to franchise the restaurant, so he was making a lot of moves in the business world. Eric was also spending a lot of money, not quite as much as Lyle, but still a lot. He bought himself a brand new Jeep Wrangler, and he also started paying for private tennis coaching, and this tennis coach charged like 50000 a year, so it was a pretty big deal, and they decided to keep living in the house. They just rented some new furniture to replace the blood-soaked furniture in the living room. At one point they thought they might move out. They were going to put down a deposit on a $900,000 penthouse, but they decided against it instead they leased two adjoining condos in Marina del Rey, and they threw a bunch of parties there, and during all this the mansion was just sitting there empty it was a reminder for them they didn't really want to go there anymore, it was scary. It reminded them of what they did. 
And at this point, the only two that knew who really killed Jose and Kitty was Lyle and Eric, they continued to spend the money, and I think it was also a way of distracting themselves from the stress they were feeling from committing a murder. They bought themselves really expensive wardrobes, Eric eventually bought himself a Rolex, those three Rolexes that Lyle bought were just for himself. So Eric had to buy his own, Eric also got really into gambling and he ended up losing a lot of money that way. He ended up changing his original plan, which was to go to UCLA for tennis, and he decided to go do these competitions in the Middle East, and he did that for a little while. Eric was actually hoping to go pro in tennis, that's how much he loved it. Detectives were starting to catch on, they started realizing that the two of them had a huge financial motive for committing this crime, plus the longer time on the boys seemed less and less interested in the investigation. They would never call and check in to see if they were any closer to figuring out who killed their parents, they didn't seem concerned about it at all. They certainly weren't acting the way you typically would if your parents had just been killed. So, they looked a little closer at the boys, and that's when they realized that they had purchased guns on August 18th. So, two days before their periods were killed, they used stolen ID to purchase the guns, and then they brought them home. Then they found out that the boys had also hired a computer expert to completely erase their family's hard drive. This was important too, because they believed that Jose had the most updated versions of his will on the computer. So police ended up talking with Eric's friend Craig, who was the one that he played tennis with, and they were working on writing a script together as well. And so they asked him to go to lunch with Eric, and he did. It was November 17th, he asked him to go to lunch, and they did like normal, but Eric seemed very nervous, very anxious, Craig kept kind of poking at him asking him what's going on. And eventually Eric confessed to everything to Craig, he really trusted Craig and he told him how the plan was for Lyle to shoot his dad, and how he was tasked with shooting his mum. And he explained though that he couldn't do it, he could not bring himself to actually shoot his mum so Lyle shot his mum as well. But they did not have a recording device for this lunch so they asked Craig to go with Eric again and get the confession out of him again this time wearing the recording device. He wore a wire and then he also had a calculator with a recording device inside of it that he was holding underneath the table and Craig asked him again about how he killed his parents, but this time he denied it he said that they didn't do it. He explained that he should have never told Craig that and that it was made. Up and being I'll never kill anybody. So then they started talking to the family's therapist Kitty was in therapy as well, and it turns out that Kitty actually told her therapist that she was afraid of her sons that she thought they were sociopaths. It turns out she was so afraid of them that she was locking herself in her bedroom at night. And after the murder first happened, Eric continued to see his therapist Dr. Oziel. According to Dr. Oziel around this time the stress and anxiety was really serious. In fact, he was getting ulcers from all these stress. During therapy sessions, Dr. Oziel thought he didn't really think through to him. I think he was kind of sensing that they may have been involved and during one of their sessions they ended up just walking in a park, they had a very casual chat and then they went back to Dr. Oziel's office and when they got there, Eric just kind of leans up against a parking meter and casually says, we did it, Dr. Oziel was shocked and he brought him into his office and had him explain the whole story. This is where Eric explained that after they murder their parents, they changed into clean clothes, they dumped their shotguns up the road. They went to the movie theater to get a ticket as their alibi for the night, Dr. Oziel told him to call Lyle and have him meet him at the office, which Lyle had no idea that Eric had just confessed everything. So he came and met him there, and he was just going to kind of talk to them. Coach them be there for them but he was secretly going to be recording this session, and he decided that he was going to have his mistress at the time actually stand outside of the door and kind of listen in just in case anything went crazy while they were talking, and she was ready to call the police at any time, and with Lyle found out that Eric had told the secrets to Dr. Ozil he was pissed. This was not part of the plan they were supposed to get away with this, and he actually ended up threatening to kill Dr. Ozil if he told anyone and instead of going to the police right away, he continued to see the brothers, and he continued to have several sessions with them and he recorded all of it and they began talk about the murders in more details, and Dr. Oziel was just keeping all of this information until the day that his mistress, her name is Judalon actually went to the police and gave them the information. And she said that she did this because Dr. Oziel was abusive to her and she wanted to get revenge on him, 
So the police found out that he had confession tapes from the boys and that they were the ones who murdered their parents. So they got a search warrant for the tapes, went and seized them from a safety deposit box that he had in a bank on Venture Boulevard. And right away, they got word that Lyle might flee the state over this, that he was terrified of getting caught, so they decided that they could waste no time Lyle clearly knew that the truth was out. So on March 8, 1990 over a dozen police officers actually stopped him as he was pulling out of his driveway. They had him get out of the vehicle laid out on the ground face down they handcuffed him and took him into the police station. It was over for them and Eric at the time was actually at a tennis tournament in Israel. He had a cry that he needed to come back with the next flight immediately so ended up flying to Miami where several of his relatives lived and then his aunt convinced him to fly back to LA and just turn himself in. He surrendered at LAX on March 11, 1990. And they wasted, no time RHE charges were filed against the boys. The next day in court, the boys didn't look that worried they came into the Beverly Hills courtroom in fancy outfits, and were smiling, they seemed confident, and when people found out that the Menendez brothers had been charged with killing their parents' friends, and family couldn't believe it. Some other family members supported them still though, they sat in the front row at trial, their tennis coach sat in the front row and Eric's girlfriend even their grandma sat in the front row Jose's mother. And she always believed that the boys were innocent. At their arraignment the judge explained to them that they were both being charged with killing their parents for financial gain and that they could be facing the death penalty and asked them how they plead and both of them said not guilty. So, the defense and prosecution spent a lot of time arguing over whether or not the tapes that Dr. Oziel had recorded could be admissible in court. Is it fair game, because they're murderers? Or does it fall under doctor-patient confidentiality? The Supreme Court of California actually made the decision that two out of the three tapes were able to be used in court and one of these tapes had Lyle's confession on it, they determined that because Lyle had threatened Dr. Azali's life. It forfeits his right to the doctor and patient confidentiality and going into the trial. They knew that now that those tapes were going to be their game, they could not pretend that the boys didn't commit this crime. They were going to have to have a different strategy. So in July of 93, it was announced for the first time ever that Eric and Lyle had actually killed their parents in self-defense, after a lifetime of psychological physical and sexual abuse at the hands of their father. And that they killed their mother as well. Because she allowed it to happen, and when this came out, the media went wild, there were so many opinions. Many people felt bad for the boys and believed them. Many people thought it was purely a defense strategy. So the trial began 10 days later, July 20, 1993, and they tried them both separately. So, you know, they had two different defense teams, two different juries, and normally they do these at different kinds. But they decided to do their trials at the same time and this was being covered extensively. It could not get enough of this trilogue, truly became a drama, a sensation. And there were definitely people that believed they were innocent and people who believed they were guilt. These Eric's friend, Craig ended up talking to the media, a bunch. He did any interview he could and he had co-written that friends a screenplay with Eric where the main character kills their parents for money. So it seemed like they planned the murder and the media kind of portrayed Lyle as the older or dominant brother that kind of convinced Eric with his plan, and they actually made the decision to broadcast the whole trial live on TV for people to watch. So it became a reality TV show, and their grandmother Maria Menendez continued to support the boys throughout the entire trial, and she didn't even think the boys actually killed their parents. She still believed the theory that someone from the mob did it. So when Eric and Lyle walked into the courtroom for their first day of trial, they did not look how they did at the arraignment hearing their smiles were gone and they seemed worn down, tired, exhausted, and lost weight they were very pale they looked very depressed during the proceedings, they just sat there staring the blankly ahead, according to people who were there. And they had a really hard time in jail, other prisoners apparently hated them and they had to pay for protection in jail. So they were clearly really hoping that they would be found not guilty. So the prosecution argued that Eric and Lyle killed their parents and or to get financial gain and that they should get the death penalty. And the defense sought to prove that they were abused, 
that they were in danger and they had to kill their parents or their parents could have killed them. Eric's defense attorney was Leslie Abramson who was a well-known advocate against death penalty and took on high-profile criminal cases. She was like, the best money could buy, she was known for being very tough and kind of a force to be reckoned with in the courtroom, she would break down people until they crying on the witness stand. Now, a lot of people think that Leslie purposely dressed the boys in a specific way to make them seem younger, instead of suits they wore colorful sweaters. She argued that even though the boys seemed like they had a perfect life on the outside that truly their lives at home were absolute hell. She argued that they were traumatized by all of the abuse, including sexual abuse that they had gotten from their father and the sexual abuse that they claimed to have gone through is horrific. They described it all in court, it was very graphic, very shocking. And she explained that Jose would abuse the boys, and Kitty will just watch and allow it to happen, and never stood up for them. She said Jose was a cruel perfectionist whose image was everything to him, and that he didn't really care much about his kids. She argued that he would be the type that would rather kill his kids than have the truth about their family come out. And she explained that Kitty was living in hell as well. Apparently, she was an alcoholic, she was a drug addict, and she was very depressed over her husband having all these affairs that she knew about. They said she was so upset, she was a dangerous driver, she was a terrible housekeeper. Pretty much a bad mom and a suicidal mist all behind closed doors. She explained that their life was totally out of control. It was messy in the house, they also had a dog and apparently the dog would go to the bathroom on a carpet so it was just messy all over the place, and they also brought up that Lyle had this pet rabbit when he was growing up and one morning he woke up and the head was bashed in, and she said that Jose and Kitty did this together and Lyle was so traumatized by all this that he went to bed until he was 14, and this is very disturbing, but they claimed that they would take the sheets off the bed. After this, and put them on the breakfast table in the morning, and make him sit, and look at them to shame him. Also, they claimed that Kitty had blamed the boys for her not being able to have a successful career in broadcasting. They even said that she had threatened to poison them at one point, so they were afraid of her. And then they made a really shocking claim and said that Kitty had been giving Eric genital exams every year until he was 15. Their family was just so full of secrets, and this was kind of a breaking point for them. The two of them started discussing how their family was toxic, and Eric started telling Lyle everything that his father had been doing to him for years, and it's very horrific. And when Lyle found out what had been happening to his brother, he apparently threatened his dad to stop, and he said if he didn't they would go public. But Jose allegedly responded, and said he's my son, I'll do whatever I want with him. And that's when they said that. The boys knew that they had to do something because they were afraid of their dad, and they were afraid maybe he would kill them to prevent the secret from getting out. And they decided to have both of the brothers give testimony at their trials. And I think that was absolutely crucial, because when you hear it from them it's just so upsetting. Whether you believe them or not just the details that they talked about was so shocking and disturbing on so many levels they gave very graphic descriptions of all he sexual abuse that both of them had endured and how their father had raped them and used inanimate objects on them, and they recounted all of this on the stand in front of everybody in court. And oftentimes they were hysterically crying through their interviews. But the public had very little sympathy for the boys, they were widely not believed. In fact, they were even mocked on Saturday Night Live and the clip of it is pretty cringe, I don't understand how this was at all funny. At one point during the trial, they had their female cousin come up and testify that Lyle had actually confided in her as a kid. When they were like eight, that he was being molested. And one thing that she said in court, that was pretty odd to me she said that the boys liked to sleep with their mother whenever their father was out of town, they would argue over who got to sleep in her bed which I mean a lot of people do that, it's not that weird, but they did this until they were 15, she noted seemed a little odd to her. And their friend Craig who had been talking to the media a lot had been told to stop talking to the media and banned from talking to media, and now he was going to be testifying in court, and he testified about how Eric had confessed to the murders 12 days after it happened. And he also talked about the screenplay that they had written which kind of was almost premeditating the murder which they actually did not have the screenplay as evidence in court so they just discussed it.
And one thing that kept being brought up in trial was this movie called Billionaire Boys Club. This came out just three weeks before the murders took place, and Dr. Ozil claimed in court that Eric had mentioned in one of the tapes that was not used in court that this movie inspired the crime because it was so similar to the way that their parents were killed. It was the story about a group of rich boys in Beverly Hills who killed their father for money. And not only that the characters wore Rolexes and drove a Jeep Wrangler. This movie was actually released by Live Entertainment, Jose's company. They weren't able to play the movie in court, but they were able to bring it up and argue that they could have been inspired by it. So the whole trial was very long, it lasted four and a half months, but it finally came to a close in January of 94. And the jury actually deliberated for about a month, and this is really interesting, but they were actually split by gender. All of the females on the jury wanted to quit and all of the men on the jury wanted to convict. They could not come to a conclusion, so they decided to go with a mistrial. So the L.A. County District Attorney immediately announced that there would be retrial for both of the boys. The second trial began in October of the 1995, and this time it was just one jury, and this time was different because they decided not to allow the media in. It had become too much of a public circus last time, so they wanted to keep it under wraps. And this time, the judge decided to not allow them to talk so much about the sexual abuse that the boys had endured. Other than that the arguments that they made were pretty much the same, it was pretty much the same trial repeated. This time though, the defense really went after a Dr. Ozil and tried to discredit him as much as possible. They said he was a liar and a cheat and just overall bad guy. And they claimed that he was planning to use these reportings as blackmail, that he was never going to go to the police. He was going to keep the secret and blackmail the boys and maybe get some money out of them, who knows. So when he testified, this time it lasted for six days. And this led to two of his mistress filing a complaint against him and the state also recommended that he lose his license and the defense was hoping that this would kind of distract the jury from Eric and Lyle and when Eric testified it actually lasted several weeks apparently he called his father. A killer said he was very afraid of him and thought that he would have killed someone if he didn't kill him first. During the cross-examination Eric actually was caught in a lie, he said that they had bought pistols for protection three years before the murder. But it turned out the store he claimed he had bought them from wasn't even open at the time and so prosecution was able to ask the jury if he could lie about that, what else is he capable of lying about? Is it all made up? The main thing that was different with this trial, though was Lyle did not testify, which was an interesting move. So this time the jury deliberated for nearly three weeks, and they ended up finding Eric and Lyle guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder, and before they were sentenced, they decided that they wanted to have their word out to public D&D they did an interview with Barbara Walters, and this is a really famous interview. So the jury ended up deciding that they were not going to move forward with the death penalty because Eric and Lyle had no history of violence but they completely rejected the idea that this was done in self-defense in any way, or that the boys were abused. The Menendez brothers were sentences to life in prison, without the possibility of parole on July 2, 1996. And this is one of the most controversial verdicts of all time. And when they were heading into the sentencing period, the brothers ended up putting in a request for them to at least be put in the same prison so they can be together, but that was denied which was pretty shocking so Lyle and Eric were separated and sent to separate Princeton's. On September 10, 1996, they waved each other from across the prison courtyard and that was the last time that they will see each other for decades, which was very very hard on them, they are extremely close and they were also considered maximum security prisoners. So they were separated from all the other inmates and spent a lot of time alone. They tried to appeal the outcome but on February 27, the California Court of Appeal upheld their convictions. In May of 1998 they tried to get the Supreme Court to review the case and they declined to do so. They've tried several times to file halves, habeas, corpus petitions with the Supreme Court in California, but they've been denied multiple times. 2005 was the last time that they were denied and they've been kind of stuck ever since. So, since then Eric and Lyle both got married in prison in 1996, Lyle married Anna Erickson, but then in 2001, Anna ended up finding out that he had been cheating on her in jail, he was writing to other women so she divorced him and he remarried again in 2003 to a woman named Rebecca, 
Eric married a woman named Tammy in 1999 and he had been writing to her pen pals for like six years before they got married. In 2005, she was interviewed by APC News, and she said that their relationship was something that she's dreamt about for a long time and in the same year she even published a book called They Said, We'd Never Make It My Life with Eric Menendez. In 2017 they did an interview with People magazine and explained that even though they were in separate prisons, they remained really close even though they couldn't see or talk to each other, they even were communicating through their wives, they were sending letters back and forth. They would even play a chess through their wives through the letters, but they finally got to see each other again in February of 2018, when Lyle was actually transferred to the same prison that his brother was in, and when they finally got to see each other in person. It had been 22 years and people who were there said that they just hugged each other in silence for minutes, and they both were crying, and after that they allowed them to have a few hours alone together. At first, they are housed in separate areas in the jail, but eventually they moved them into the same unit. So now they get to spend time together every day, they get to have meals together and walk around, get exercise together outside and a lot of their family members still stand by them to this day, and they're very happy that they're at least now together. Some family members have even spoken out that they are absolutely sure that Eric and Lyle really did go through years of horrific abuse at the hand of their father and that their mother let it happen. This is all I have for this case thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed please subscribe. Comment and leave a thumbs up down below and thank for watching once again.